All right, everybody, how are you? How are you? I'm Mr. Campos. Welcome to my art class of uh, spring 2023. Uh, some of you are coming back from last semester, and some of you are new. And uh, if you are new, welcome. We're going to have fun. Um, I try to keep my class as easy and as exciting as I can. Um, this is our, our first class. I will be live with you guys the the after next after this week. So next week I will be with you live. Uh, it's just that I had to take care of something this Friday, so I could not uh, be here live. So I'm doing this recording uh, for you, so you can get started and you don't stay behind. All right. So um, let's go ahead and uh, answer this question, and you can think of it yourself and uh, share your answer through either the class Padlet or through email, if you want to. All right, so what is more important to you, ambition or comfort? Ambition or comfort? So think about that. Because remember, ambition uh, does require a little bit of sacrifice, a little bit of a risk. But comfort makes you feel comfortable, at peace, at ease, happy, uh, a little bit less stressful. So think about that. What would be more important to you? Um, I think a balanced life for myself was it, it would be to have both. You know, you got to have some ambition to get out there and uh, make a better version of yourself. But also, you don't want to be stressed all the time. You want to have some comfort and enjoy life. All right. So when you come in next week, you're going to uh, be asked to allow your camera and your mic make sure that you do allow it. And by doing that, you, you just got to go to this little lock here at the top left corner. Click on that lock and then you're going to see this uh, little pop up here. And that way you can get on camera, hop on the mic and things like that. If it doesn't work, try refreshing. Or if you have a Windows computer, hit F5. All right, the next one is the agenda. We have the norms. Learning objective, unit three, that's where we're going to start. Uh, we have some reminders, and I have an exit ticket. You can get the exit ticket um, in the class announcements. They're going to be posted on my classroom page. So always check the class announcements. Very important. All right, so uh, this is Norm. This is our uh, art, fine art mascot. He's an owl. So. Hello, I'm Norm, 100% participation, 100% professionalism. 100% of the time, you are valued in this course. We are so glad you're here. So remember that in last semester, if you were to read the norms, I would write your name down. And if I had plenty of kids, we would do a drawing. And if, you, uh, if your name wins the drawing, you win a prize. Uh, so, you know, I encourage you to read the norms, hop on the mic. Don't be shy. All right, so let's read the teaks for the week. Uh, let's see, analyze, distinguish between realist, impressionist, and post-impressionist works of art. Learn new language structures, expressions, basic and academic vocabulary, and so on. All right, uh, passing rate goal. My personal goal for this class is 100%. Um, that's not always realistic. It would be an awesome dream, but uh, those are my expectations. I do want you to uh, do the best that you can, and if you're having trouble, reach out to me. I would love to help you. <clears throat> All right, if you have some artwork you want to share with us as a classroom, here is my, my Padlet. My Padlet is called the Art Barbecue Grill 2, so the, the very first year that I started with TVA, it was the Art Barbecue Grill 1, but now we have two. And these are some of the artworks that um, were from Art Barbecue Grill 1, I believe. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was our, uh, the first year. So you can either scan this QR code or um, go to the class announcements, and you're going to see the link that says Our Class Padlet. All right. So share things with us. You can share ideas. You can share uh, artworks. I have kids that have uh, 
shared plenty of stuff and it looks great. Uh, you can also, when you're finished with your um, projects and it looks really cool, you can share it with us. Okay. So I know it says assignments cannot be turned in this way. So do not turn in assignments for a grade in the Padlet. Just share it with us. Uh, remember that you have to turn in through my classroom under tools assignments. Next up, uh, reminders. I will get with with you on that some other time. Uh, this from, was from another teacher, so let's go ahead and move on. My number is 903-833-6306. Text or call or email anytime. Next up, this is a get to know you bingo. So there's plenty of questions that you can do here. And if you win the bingo, uh, take a screenshot and upload it into the Padlet. Here's a couple of questions. What is your favorite food or beverage? So you would write something down. What is your dream vacation? Where would you go? What is the best book you've uh, ever read? I have plenty of uh, great books I've read. Which superpower would you want to have? Uh, flight, invisibility, super strength. If you could time travel, uh, which year would you visit? And so on. Fill as many squares as you can. Make sure that the bingo is five in a row. So one, two. Well, actually, this bingo is kind of weird. I would say, I would say you can go left to right and up and down left to right up and down i don't think you can go diagonally here it should be five well whatever all right let's go on let's go on so remember that my classroom is going to be room number one fine art okay so you click on that make sure that you check for class connects or recordings this is a recording of this class so make sure that you uh view it watch it and then Go ahead and do the assignments. All right, make sure that you uh, look at the checklist. Look at the checklist. It's going to be on the left side. When you come in, it's going to be on your left side of the home page. And then you're going to look at the calendar and look at the activities that you have to do for that week. Let's see. Okay, these are read alongs. Okay, if you don't want to read, if you want to hear a recording, someone reading this to you you can go into that section of the content they have read-alongs for each section all right we're going to begin unit three realism to post-impressionism realism to post-impressionism they are two separate types of art styles uh some of you might like realism some of you might like uh impressionism or post-impressionism um i like post-impressionism uh, realism, I used to like it when I was younger because it looks so, you know, realistic. But um, it just, it, I, I guess it was the colors, you know, it was kind of muted. When we got into uh, Impressionism, I didn't really like it too much because it looked very dreamy and blotchy. And I didn't like the colors, but Post-Impressionism is one of my favorites. Uh, let's see. Art vocabulary. The next two slides have vocabulary vocabulary words for this unit. These slides will be a great reference for you as you read and even during class. Remember that these are going to be on your quiz or your test, so please pay close attention. Uh, you can take a picture of them if you want. And these slides that we're looking at right now are posted in my announcements, so uh, you cannot miss. All right, here we go. So we have cool colors, uh, chiaroscuro, warm colors, abstract, pointillism, the daguerreotype, and that's it for the vocab vocabulary for now. All right, let's go ahead and see uh, cool colors, cool colors that create a cool feeling in an artwork, So such as blue, green, and violet. You mix them together, you're going to get those, uh, you know, like cool emotions or maybe sadness or maybe calm um chiaroscuro the use of light and dark to show highlights and shadows on 
objects. This is great when you want to make a sort of like a mystery scene. Somebody is in the dark, but there's like a little bit of light shining. It creates mystery. Um, yeah, a chiaroscuro is very awesome, especially with photography. Warm colors, colors that create a warm feeling in an artwork such as red, orange, and yellow. Okay, red, orange, and yellow uh, can evoke moods of happiness. It can also be used for anger, you know, red and, and like orange, a volcano. All right, abstract, having an unidentifiable object, but without normal details and with visual elements rearranged or simplified. So you take uh, something that you recognize and you kind of break it down and you twist it and bend it and uh, it, it turns into an abstract picture. Okay, as you can tell, we have a, a guitar here, but the colors and uh, the shapes are not realistic. So it turns it into an abstract object. Pointillism, a stippling technique of like little dots in which an artist uses closely placed closely placed dots of various colors uh, from a distance. Your eyes mix the color dots in an uh, in the artwork to see the picture come together. So from far away, a pointillism picture looks uh, like a normal picture, but once you get once you get very close, it just looks like blotches of paint. Looks like little tiny dots everywhere. And it's pretty hard to look at. So when you go far away, it looks like a real picture, but there's like a sort of fuzziness to it. So that's the that's the visual effects. That's the visual effect of uh, pointillism, which is is pretty interesting. Pretty interesting. All right, let's uh, let's go to this slide here. Okay, so in the late 1800s and the very early. Um, 1900s there was a techno technological advances of the industrial revolution uh had a profound it had a profound effect on art and architecture so things were moving along very fast uh the industrial revolution gave birth to an entirely new art form called photography so in the late 1800s well i'd say more like the mid to the late 1800s um they started developing photography and for the way that we develop pictures was a lot different than the way you guys do it now. You just take a picture and it's instantly there with your phone or a digital camera. Before you had to, uh, you had to take a picture on this huge, big camera. It was heavy. It was clunky. You would use like film strips, and uh, sometimes you had to like stand for a while, stand still for a while, so it can develop. Or you know. Catch the capture the light, uh, create the picture. Then you would take it to a lab and and develop it. And it was just it was just like a big hassle, but it was it was kind of cool at the time. So um, meanwhile, time honored architectural styles here on the right. So this is a photography on the left, but on the right we have architectural styles that gave way to new designs that accommodated the changing dynamics of the modern world. So the new types of uh, buildings that were created were made with steel and glass. So this building looks like it's made of all glass, but there are some um, steel beams in between to hold it together because you can't make an entirely an entire building out of glass that would uh, not be safe. Uh, but there was a new style of architecture instead of just like, uh, you know, just brick and mortar or, or stone, just like the, in the ancient times. Now we're uh, we're having new designs uh, for architecture. Let's see. This is the Crystal Palace. Uh, it, it was in London. It's made out of iron and glass from 1850. Okay, so you can uh, there was a lot a lot of light that you can see through during the daytime. So that was like an innovation. Uh, take two to about two minutes to Google this. Look at pictures of the crystal palace you will not see any modern pictures of the crystal palace because unfortunately um it was i think it was either demolished or caught fire but it, it's it's no longer there it does not exist anymore which is kind of sad because i wanted to visit the crystal palace when i first saw it on the internet and i was like oh it's no longer there all right uh kept the first kept structural supports visible 
okay so you didn't hide the beams that supported it you kind of showed everything the whole skeleton of the building which uh, i don't really like but uh it kind of works sometimes it looks like a greenhouse it had glass walls and ceilings uh, took less than a year to complete so that was pretty quick and uh, could be dismantled and reassembled and this was a picture of what the crystal palace looked like inside so it's pretty cool it looks like a, a greenhouse there all right uh let's go ahead and take a video break and watch this And this video is also going to be in the announcements. The link is going to be in the announcements. Okay, so that talked about the, the garyotype, the early form. It I guess it did not use a film, it, but it must have been developed on plates and things like that. So it was like an early, more primitive way of making photographs. Uh, but it was a huge success at the time. Uh, but like always, things things change, you know. Uh, characteristics of the daguerreotype. What do you think is a characteristic or quality of the daguerreotype? So take a look at that. I give you like a couple of seconds. Do you think it's A, B, C, or D? Okay, so uh, let me go ahead and move this mic up a little bit because it's kind of leaning down. There we go. All right, so the answer to this question is going to be B. The image captures great detail, pattern, and texture, and it looks as realistic as possible. Look, as, It looks as realistic as possible. Why? Because it's a photograph. It's not a painting. It is a reproduction of real life. Uh, here we go. Realism and French realism. In the 19th century, century uh, which is the 1800s, a group of French artists turned away from classical subjects to depict pastoral scenes of everyday life. So pastoral scenes are uh, scenes of farm life, uh, people working, uh, things that we don't really find very fun and exciting. Uh, you know, we're not talking about uh, battles and we're not talking about uh you know mythical gods fighting each other or or love scenes and or you know things like that that was that was painted before this uh now the realism uh the realism movement movement wanted to depict farm life and things like that john francois millet and rose rosa bunior uh, painted outdoor scenes of peasants, farms, and domestic animals. Their insp inspiration came from nature instead of the more traditional subjects taught in art schools of the time. This is called The Gleaners by Malay. And this is plow plowing in the... I don't know how to say that. V Nivemay, the dressing of the vines. Hmm by Rosa Bunyor. And this is the actual picture of these cows here. It's over eight feet long and four feet high. It's actually much bigger than I thought. All right, we're gonna take a video break to explain realism.
All right, so as you can see, uh, realism uses a lot of uh, neutral colors, like I explained last semester. Neutral colors are yellow, black, grays, and browns. You mix them, blend them together with regular colors, and you're going to get a realistic look in your pictures, okay? Not too colorful, but more realistic. Sometimes it looks good. Sometimes it might look a little bit boring, um, but it does create realism. So if you want to paint in that style, I would highly suggest you use lots and lots of neutral colors. And I'm going to be repeating this a lot when you start making your project. Okay, here's Jean-Francois Millet. What do you notice about this painting? How does this painting make you feel? And how do you think the artist feels about the figures in the painting? Tell me uh, either in the Padlet or email me or maybe uh, write it down and uh, think of it yourself. These are the Gleaners by Malay. Okay, Millet is a French realism painter born in 1814 to a family of peasant farmers in Normandy, France. Founder of the Barbizon School of French Painting, the painting The Gleaners show the poorest of the poor picking up scraps of grain. Okay, so these were not paintings of the rich anymore because that's what people used to paint, royalty and all that, but now uh, the poor and the working class are being painted. Okay, the figures become part of the landscape with solid shapes and earthy colors. Earthy colors are going to be those neutral colors that I was talking about earlier. The haystacks and wagons reflect the shapes of the gleaners. Uh, and this was seen as a socialist painting. Rosa Bunor, her parents belong to a militant religious socialist movement that advocated equal rights and education for women. The dressing of the vines. This is the picture of the, uh, of, you know, the cows plowing. As a woman, she had to learn her art without the schooling available to aspiring artists of her time. So that means it was more difficult for women to get into school, um, you know, because they didn't have those type of types of rights yet. Uh, but she did it, you know, uh, she achieved something. Why do you think this, why is this painting a realism painting? Why is it a realism painting? Can you figure that out? What is the subject matter? Look at the colors. Look at the colors. Are they very colorful like a rainbow? Lot, do, you, do you see a lot of neon colors like pinks or do you see earthy neutral colors? What qualities does it have to make it a realism painting? What is idealization? Let's find out what idealization is. Artistic idealization. Ideal, idealization definition. Artistic idealization refers to the method of portraying people, places, or things in a romanticized or, or and unrealistically perfect form. So this is what real life would look like. And this is uh, life on Instagram. So if you look at Instagram, people try to look very perfect. You put the filters on, uh, make your face look very smooth. But that's not how people look in real life. Okay, so it's all an illusion. So every time people think of Paris, whenever you mention Paris, like I'm going to visit Paris, everybody thinks Paris looks like this. There's uh, beautiful cars, uh, streets are all... Uh, nice, orderly, uh, nice little shops, coffee, coffee cafes, and all that stuff, baguettes, and the uh, Eiffel Tower. All right. Um, it's not really like that. I've been I've been to Paris before. Um, it was okay, you know. I didn't enjoy it as much as I wanted it to, but it was cool to visit. And this is also Paris, okay? This is probably not next to the Eiffel Tower, next to the nice coffee shops. This is probably uh, in some kind of downtrodden um, neighborhood, maybe outside of Paris or something, you know, in the slums. And these kids probably come from families who don't have a lot of money. Okay. 
So that's what idealization is, trying to make something perfect and beautiful, but it's all an illusion. All right, here we go. If you can guess which one is a realism painting, is it going to be the left or is it going to be the right? Is it the left or the right? So think about that one. Think about that one. Which one is realism? American realism artist. So we were talking about the French ones. Now we're talking about the American ones. Many Americans, American artists embraced realism in the 19th century. Realism began in France, but soon caught on throughout Europe and the United States. Artists focused on contemporary themes producing realistic depic depictions of their newly industrialized society. So we have Prisoners, Prisoners from the Front by Homer, and we have The Thankful, Thankful Poor by Henry Tanner. And also notice they are using blends of neutral, earthy colors. So everything looks kind of like browns and yellowish, uh, grays, things like that. Doesn't look so exciting, but it does look realistic. All right. Winslow Homer, born in 1936. Winslow Homer was a mainly self-taught oil painter, watercolorist. He began working on well-known uh, periodi periodical called the Harper's Weekly, which is, I think it's still around. Homer's employment with Harper's Weekly gave him an unprecedented access to the war front in Virginia. So he was able to... Uh, be amongst the soldiers who were fighting at the time. He made keen observations of soldiers and produced many lifelike sketches. After the war, he incorporated these sketches into his first oil paintings. Okay, Prisoners from the Front. Uh, Homer based his painting, Prisoners from the Front, right here, on sketches he had made during the time he spent with the Union Army from the North. To Winslow Homer, art had a purpose. Its purpose was to tell the truth. So as you can see, these soldiers, they look a little bit tired. They look a little bit uh, weary, you know. Um, that That's the, the emotion that uh, Homer is trying to create with this painting. And then we have the officer here. Uh, it looks a little bit cleaner, and he's standing straighter, but he, you know, probably was not in the front fighting. So uh, we have two separate classes here. Okay, let's go to the next one. Henry Tanner, born in Pittsburgh, 1859. His parents escaped slavery through the Underground Railroad. Considered to, to be the most accomplished African-American painter of his time. As a black artist in post-Civil War America, this is after the war, Tanner had difficulty gaining recognition and finding a market for his paintings. In 1891, he moved to Paris, where his talent was greatly admired in French art circles. Wow, so that's... Uh, he, he made paintings about America, but he could not find an audience in America, but he was more appreciated in France. So remember that uh, if you can't find a good audience where, wherever you are, best thing to do is move somewhere else and you, so you can be appreciated. The Thankful Poor. What can you tell me about this painting? What do you notice? What about the colors? Remember what I explained. Earthy, neutral colors. What is the subject matter here? What is the first thing that catches your eye? Think about that. All right, Henry Tanner used lights and shadows to create a serious mood. Um, Tanner also employed dark and light values to create a convincing sense of space. The bright sunlight reflects off the back wall and creates a striking contrast against the boy's thick umber hair and the man's silhouette. So light versus dark, kind of like chiaroscuro, like I was telling you. Except, except it's a little lighter. Very good. Okay, so this is going to be a word puzzle. If you can, uh, let's go ahead and find some of these words here. Here we go. 
Let's see if we can find any of them. I found Impressionism. We're just going to find a few. You can find the rest of them on your own. I see the scream. This Everybody knows the scream, that painting. That painting is uh, considered post-impressionism, which we're going to talk about later. Um, let's see what else we have. Um, hmm. I'm usually good at this, but... Okay, we found realism. Let's try to find one more. One more. Okay, Monet. He's uh, an impressionist. All right. And let's continue. These are the answers right here. Oh, Crystal Palace was right here. How did I miss that one? Okay, image reveal game. Look at the reveal clues on the shared screen. Tell me in the chat. You don't have to tell me in the chat because you're not here. Uh, if you find the name of the painting, let me know in the class padlet. Okay, it's not going to be this painting. It's going to be a, a different painting. So you're going to go in there and you're going to guess which one it is. All right. If you want to learn more, if you want to learn more about realism, um, what is the difference between realism and naturalism? I have the video posted in the announcements. And I'll show you what it looks like real quick. So she just explained it, everyday life. These are pictures of everyday life. So nothing, nothing mystical. It's uh, everyday life. All right. A virtual tour of the Crystal Palace. If you want a virtual uh, tour, there's going to be a link in the announcements. Uh, it says here that the Crystal Palace was moved from its original location, and I didn't even know that, to a new location and then eventually burned down. Eventually burned down. I didn't know that glass would burn. I do have a link for a virtual tour of what it may have looked like. You can scan this, or you can go to my announcements and click on the link. All right, we have a few more questions. Um, if you do have questions, please email me. We have a few more to go. Reminders. Okay, your Unit 306 quiz is due January 20th. January 20th, which is going to be next Friday. Next Friday on the 20th. So you should have gone to content, read all that stuff about realism, and get started on your quiz. Your unit 3.19 test is going to be due January 27th, January 27th. So we're going to cover a couple of more things by the 20th. And then by the 20th, 27th, you're going to take your test. All right. Okay. This is your exit ticket. You can scan this QR code. Or you can go to the announcements in my class page and then click on that, submit your answer, uh, and show me what you have learned. Remember, you must uh, be signed to your TVA email account in order to do Nexic Ticket. Do not use like your learning coach account or your parents' account. It has to be your, your own personal student TVA email account. While you do not receive a grade for your exit ticket, it is not for a grade, uh, it is required. Okay, I want you to practice what you have learned. Try to understand. So that way it helps you with the test instead of just guessing at the last minute. This is your way of giving me feedback of how I taught today. 
this is going to be the link. It's also in the announcements and it's also right here. Okay, so this is our first class for the semester. Um, I hope you did learn some things about realism, photography, architecture, and all that. And we're going to be talking about next about impressionism and then post impressionism and then modern art. And then that would be the end of the semester. All right, I'm Mr. Campos. Thank you so much. If you need to reach me, uh, fcampos at tivahouseville.org. You guys have an awesome day and an awesome weekend. Oh, and no school on Monday. Have a good one.